We did not receive the miracle that we prayed for. Uh, we have accounted for our four miners that have been unaccounted for. We have a total of 29 brave miners uh, who are were, were recovering at this time. Uh, we had been s spending time with the family, as you can tell. It, it's a very difficult time. Very strong people, very loving and good people, but very, very hard, hard times. Families are, I guess, have closure, but it's pain still there. It won't go away. Safety first is the stuff of idiocy. It allows us to begin to believe that somebody other than us might care more about our well-being than we do. And the minute we buy into that nonsense, yes. then we embrace the warm grip of complacency. So no, safety is not the enemy. But if you make it the priority, then let's just wrap ourselves in bubble pack and drive at speeds approaching five miles an hour and never assume anything that could ever be confused with risk. When you work for, for coal companies like this, you're, you don't have no right. They, they tell you either do it or you're fired. You don't you, you don't have no rights when you when you're with the uh, company. You know it's non-union. Your voice don't mean nothing. You can't say no. If you say no, they say hit the road. If you can put yourself in the chair of the person considering hiring you, yeah. and say to them exactly what you would want to hear if you were them. Hi, it's great to be here. Here's the deal. Uh, I will be early every day. I will stay late every day. I will ask you what I can do every day to make your life simpler. If there's a difficult task, I will volunteer to do it. I will do so cheerfully. Coal mines, all they think about is money. I'm going to say it this way. What the mine inspectors and staff, they get paid off. See, they, they don't that. They just do what they tell them to do. What comes before safety? What are the two things? You get to fill in the blanks. Personally, yeah. I would put uh, money mm -hmm. and um, I guess it's getting the job done. Some of the violations that he gets by with just unreal. Some things I've seen is unreal. Some of the conditions he puts his men in is just unbelievable. You just have to be there to even know what some of these men go through every day just to make a living. I've seen mine inspectors write him up before and he just gets by with it. And he made a comment, supposedly, that uh, it's cheaper for him to pay the violations than fix the problem. The cost that comes along with, ex with, with letting somebody else assume responsibility for your safety, mm -hmm. the cost is incalculable. You know, ask an actuary, okay, for the insurance issues, the regulation, I mean, it's on and on and on. I mean, and these mines around here, they're dangerous. And these men have to go in there and make a living. And I'll tell you what, the grief around here is just overwhelming, and you can feel it everywhere you go. There are a lot of people who really and truly, truly believe the system is rigged, and they truly believe opportunity is dead. Uh, that's a, they scare me, um, not because I'm frightened of them, but because that belief is, uh, that, that'll kill us. <laughs>
or I'll find a way to be happy. Don't expect anyone else to watch out for your safety. That's too expensive for your employers to have to pay for. What if OSHA got it wrong? I mean, I, this is heresy, what I'm about to say, but what if, what if it's really safety third, right? He has codified this pro-billionaire, pro-entrepreneur, faux working class moral philosophy into what he calls the Sweat Pledge, a set of ideas that you have to agree to if you want access to a comically small amount of money. They're not big allotments, you know, it could be anywhere between two and 15 grand, depending on the, on, on the applicant. Which can only be used towards certain vocational training programs, which Mike Rowe himself has assented to. In this video, I want to go over where Mike Rowe gets his bad ideas from, some of his worst ideas and why they're so wrong, some other stuff he's wrong about, and maybe, if we have time left over, some footage of puppies. <laughs> it's, 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 it's so much more in interesting to understand why you believe what you believe than it is to hear about what you believe. The first thing you need to know about Mike Rowe is that the man who said this, Never follow your passion, but always bring it with you. He is terrible at taking his own advice. He's an actor, a job that you only ever get by following your passion instead of being practical. And even though he rails against four-year colleges, he'll be the first to admit that my liberal arts degree served me really, 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 really well. He likes to square this hypocrisy in the same way that John Wayne squared being a draft dodger by massively overcompensating. So we make a bigger fire, you know, come back with a bigger carcass, right. you know, feed the girl, build a bigger house, kids, bigger house. He claims that while he worshipped his blue collar grandfather as a child and wanted to grow up to be just like him, he just didn't quite have the knack for filthy plebeian work and was forced to resign himself to being a multi-millionaire pitch man instead. People who see dirty jobs figure I'm like Bob Vila or like right. Joe Handy. I'm not. That's a... Uh, that's a recessive gene. Sure. Right? And, and my grandfather, who got it in spades, was sort of uh, an, an idol of mine growing up. So I very much wanted to do what he could do, which essentially was build a house without a blueprint. Right. right? Ooh, that's impressive. Well, he, he only went to the seventh grade. And I just always assumed that's what I would do. And I, and I just didn't get the gene. And then when I got so frustrated that I couldn't do it, <laughs> it, it was my pop who said, you know what? You can be a tradesman if you want. You just need a different toolbox. So mm. that's when I, I enrolled at a community college after high school and I started studying things I had no interest in. Maybe he should have tried following his own advice then. After all, it's not like his grandfather had any real training, so it shouldn't matter whether or not Mike had the knack for the work from day one. There is no hope without education. Mm -hmm. You have to have some sort of useful skill. Oh. Well, either way, Mike Rowe has tragically endured the rigors of getting edumacated and will now and forever be a little bit pretentious. I still hosted shows, but I did it through a kind of, uh, the Greeks would call it a peripatia, right? Yeah. An anagnoresis. <sighs> what Huxley say? You know, the, uh, the greatest threat to, to freedom was total anarchy. The second greatest threat was total efficiency. What other peripatetic misconceptions might I be able to comment upon? I like the idea of the uh, the classic freelancer. I always have. But you know where the word came from, by the way? Uh, tell me. I'm going to, Nick. He's also stuck living in San Francisco for some reason, even though all of the people with his reported $35 million are supposedly fleeing in some kind of mass exodus. The wealthiest people will just say, I'm not working anymore. I live in California. I just read a report that said the, uh, the exodus this year mm -hmm. as a result of a 13 and a half percent state tax and some other tweaks to the system is unlike anything they've ever seen before. A claim which has been repeatedly debunked, by the way. Thankfully, Roe is at least able to keep a modest apartment with a view of Alcatraz, which likely only runs him a minor pittance in rent every Jesus Christ. Uh, I'll assume he's in one of the cheaper apartments and also somehow doesn't own multiple properties, even though he's rich. It does sometimes seem as if pretty much the only thing Mike Rowe has ever successfully manufactured is a false public persona. The question is why? To hear him tell it, it's because he's always had a respect for people who do dirty jobs, although I do find it interesting that he rarely admits to the distinction between people who do those jobs because they're poor and people who do them because they're, like Roe himself, filthy, stinking rich. People think dirty jobs was a love letter to blue collar work. It was actually a love letter to entrepreneurship. Great. 40 of the people we featured on there of the 300 were multimillionaires. Nobody knew it. In fact, just scrolling down a list of Dirty Jobs episodes reveals some major disparities in things like level of education and likelihood of business ownership. It seems almost like he's trying to purposely squash out class consciousness. But again, 
Why? Hey, uh, totally unrelated, but let's take a gander at the donations page for his foundation. Huh. Well, that's alarming. The skills gap has nothing to do with unemployment, not really. The, the skills gap proves that opportunity alone isn't enough to get people un unemployed. Right. Right. And, and really neither is training. You can have all the opportunity and all the training in the world, but if you don't have an underlying appreciation for the work, if you're not talking about jobs that people affirmatively aspire to, you're going to be pushing the the boulder up the hill. No, there is no skills gap. This is a fabrication on the level of a conspiracy theory and Rose increasingly bizarre and hypocritical justifications for why this supposed skills gap exists do a good job of proving that he doesn't have anyone else's best interests in mind. But before we get to his insultingly low opinion of American workers, let's utterly destroy his skills gap conspiracy. The shifting numbers are a misinterpretation of data coming from the Bureau of Labor Statistics monthly survey, the Jolts Report. On any given month, you'll likely find about 5 million to 6 million reported job openings lining up with Rose figures, but these openings aren't just sitting there unclaimed. In November 2017, for example, roughly 3 million are from workers quitting and another roughly 2 million are from layoffs or firing. There are also some retirements in there. This means that there are fewer than a million unaccounted for, which might be new jobs. This actually shows some healthy movement in the jobs market. Most of the openings are from workers quitting, which means that they likely already have opportunities lined up elsewhere. More separations actually occur during a better economy, whereas people hoard their jobs during recessions. But here's the real final nail in the coffin for Mike Rowe's shady sales pitch, which I'll quote directly from the NACE journal. Nevertheless, if all these openings, whether they result from separations or from the creation of new positions, went unfilled, then that would present a serious problem for the economy. However, the same BLS job opening report also provides the count of new hires made each month. For November 2017, BLS reports that employers hired 5.5 million workers. This leaves approximately 400,000 job openings that went unfilled during November, which represents 0.2% of the U.S. labor market. It is important to note that the November 2017 figures are very consistent with the monthly data since January 2016. In fact, hires have exceeded separations and the openings they create for every month since 2010. A mass of jobs in the United States are not going unfilled. Boy, it looks like maybe that liberal arts degree really didn't work out for Mike Rowe after all. Speaking of degrees, Rowe is obviously correct in saying that the price of a four-year degree is going up, although he gets the actual rate hilariously wrong. The cost of a degree, and this I do know because I've read it in several reputable sources, <laughs> uh, has increased at over 500 times the rate of inflation since the mid-80s. 500 times the rate of inflation. Nothing else comes close, not even healthcare. Yeah, in reality, it's about twice the rate of inflation, although I've seen different numbers, not 500 times the rate of inflation. Comedically, he seems to have confused the separate college inflation rate quoted in this Forbes article with an increase in comparison to the consumer inflation rate and also doesn't understand the difference between a 500% increase and an increase of 500 times, which is just stunningly wrong. But okay, bad math aside, Roe has identified a real problem here and I respect that. His solutions though are totally ineffective. For one thing, the job openings rate on the kind of employment that Roe is trying to bolster is is low enough that getting educated for it is simply not your best bet. And a lot of these jobs do require education because despite saying both this, I'm not saying that what you ought to do is go to high school and then go straight to work. And this, you know, I talked to a kid the other day uh, up in Butler, North Dakota. So it's Butler, right? It's cold, but he works on heavy equipment up there and um, over a hundred bucks an hour, work when he wants, paid for his house in cash, raising a family. You know, is it better right now today to have 140000 in debt but a degree from Georgetown in law? Or is it better to be that kid I described up in Butler? Roe is somehow wrong about both. Being a welder is definitely a job that you need a real education for in most instances. And there are low-skill jobs available right out of high school, like construction and retail. They suck, and you should leave them as quickly as possible if you get trapped in them, but they are available without going to a trade school. This is the dichotomy that most people 
people understand implicitly and which Roe is pretending doesn't exist. Bad jobs for people without educations and good jobs for people with them. The numbers bear out in that direction, with even the availability of work increasing with higher degrees of educational attainment. Look, I want to be clear about something here. There's nothing disrespectful about taking on a dirty job. Somebody does have to do it. But one, a lot of service and retail jobs, which Roe doesn't care to talk about, are also dirty jobs. And two, people are more complex than this. You can get a job right out of high school, then go to a trade school, and then later get a bachelor's or master's degree. If Mike Rowe really believed in what he was saying, if he was really out there to help people, then he'd be for free college for all. Oh, wait. So 60, 70 grand a person, that's a personal tragedy. But add it up, it's 1.6 trillion right now. And we hold the note on that. Yeah. You know, well, maybe not up there in Canada, but you know, down here. Oh no, it's worse up there. It's basically education's free up there, but you're paying for it as a taxpayer. How's it free? Not, nothing is free. Exactly. Well, good news, Mike, because actually, free college would be cheaper than paying for our current system. Partially because private schools, which quite a lot of vocational schools are, are a major drain on society. Not only do private school students tend to have more debt, but they cost the taxpayers more. Meanwhile, they suck. In fact, it turns out that at least one of the Trump administration's accredited private universities was just a big old scam and doesn't even serve any students. Nothing's free except for conning money out of the average American's pocket. Right, Mike? By the way, since we're chatting, Michael Rosef, do you remember that one time that you called Bernie Sanders a knucklehead for pointing out that college helps keep people out of prison? Well, as it turns out, you are the finger-jointed cranium haver. Man, it'd be really nice if you could do even the most basic amount of research. It just really feels like you're not bringing your passion with you on this grift of yours, you know? By the way, I remember that not long ago there was an issue in the state of California in which the online college was being rolled out amidst multiple complaints, one of which was that at an actual physical campus, services could be provided which were unavailable elsewhere. For example, homeless students, real human beings that Mike Rowe doesn't seem to care about, could sleep in their vehicles at an actual campus. There's even a bill being worked on, AB 302, to write this ability into law. I thought about that story while doing research for this video, because as it turns out, in 2017, the president of a Vaterot College location was fired for allowing a homeless student to shelter in negative four degrees Fahrenheit. Vaterot was a Midwestern chain of private trade schools. I say was because they lost their accreditation and shut down in 2018 after numerous scandals including lying about the transferability of credits and providing false documents to illegally steal federal loan money from taxpayers. By coincidence, I happen to find a website that still lists Vaterot as an option, and under grants and scholarships, hmm, I wonder if any of the work ethic scholarship recipients attended there. Well, to me, it's, it's either, s it's, it's uncertainty. We used to look at uncertainty as this thing fun. that was similar to variety, right? It's like, yeah. I don't know what's gonna happen next. And so, you know, whether you're reading a book or watching a movie or taking a trip, not knowing what's around the corner used to be part of the fun of it. Now it's stress inducing and, 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 and heavy with potential right. trauma, right? So that, that's, I'm not a social anthropologist or a shrink, but that strikes me as something that's, that's really fundamental. We've, we've, we've arbitraged the fun out of uncertainty. Right. Having to choose between paying your medical bills and paying for your children's school supplies is not a fun journey, Mike. I know that you're a millionaire because of the hard work of the Screen Actors Guild, that union you belong to, but the rest of us have been watching our wages stagnate and inflation go up for decades. But hey, thanks for insulting us, real Americans. Clearly, we're all just lazy jerks who need to really appreciate our bourgeoisie owner class. It's not just a skill gap. It's a will gap. My town can't die. My job can't go away. I had it and now it's gone. And so, time out, party foul. Hey, wait a minute, that's not what you said on NBC. There you just pivoted like a hypocrite because you were more interested in enjoying the nauseating praise of your neoliberal compadres in capitalism. I was talking to a guy that runs a, a fast, pretty fast growing manufacturing. Uh, thing. And, and he had this to say to me about the whole exercise of job retraining and what it means for somebody in their 40s. Take a listen to this, Mike. If you've been out on this floor doing skilled or semi-skilled work and you're 40 years old, you don't want to go do a computer-based job. You want to make things. And so that's part of the problem. You can have thousands of really good training programs, but the training needs to be the vocational, and then there has to be the job opening. We, 
always focused on job retraining and it's always about computers. It's always about, uh, when there's skill layer, it's always about engineering and different things. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But it's almost as if we're saying, no, those other jobs, they're, they're, they're going away and it's okay that they go away. Well, some people want to want to touch things people ask me all the time you know what's a what's the big takeaway from that show you know and and there were many but the for me the thing I keep coming back to is the idea that as a group there was a level of job satisfaction that uh, was undeniable and surprising I think what you showed a certain way was that there's dignity that these people feel toward their jobs job is much more than just how you pay your bills and what you're doing for your family and what your kid can go to college it's what you feel when you go to work every day yeah you think they'll ever uh, ask him about statements like this hey yeah, Mike can you combine with the White House at all because it seems like Ivanka has the same lines you have about learning a trade and learning a skill have you been in contact yeah, we have. And I'll tell you the bottom line for me. After 10 years of doing this, my foundation's modest. We've, we've raised about $5 million for work ethic scholarships. It's and it's true. There, we, we are aligned in a lot of ways. But look, you guys know it as well as anybody. If I put the red hat on, half the country isn't going to hear me. Nah. By the way, since I know you read Forbes, and since you only care about money, here are some statistics on what your attitude is costing us. But hey, like you say... Happiness is a, it's a, it's a terrific symptom. It's, it's a terrible goal. This is probably the worst position that Mike Rowe has taken publicly, which is saying a lot. In 2010, the Upper Big Branch mine disaster claimed the lives of 29 people, none of whom advocates like Mike Rowe care about. The president he endorses has relaxed safety standards for mining to such a degree that Robert Cohen, a member of the Mine Safety and Health Panel who served under George W. Bush and Barack Obama, has called it illegal. Specifically, the Pocahontas Coal Company's Affinity Mine has been given a pass despite a pattern of violations which endanger everyone there. In 2012, Gary May pleaded guilty to conspiracy to defraud the government. Prosecutors made the argument that he had manipulated the mine ventilation system at Upper Big Branch to fool safety officials in a desire to put production and profits first. What comes before safety? What are the two things? You get to fill in the blanks. Yeah. Personally, I would put uh, money mm -hmm. and... Um, I guess it's getting the job done. Mm -hmm. Roe claims that he believes in a controversial idea called risk compensation. One day, I came across this study that concluded the most dangerous traffic intersections were those with signs that told pedestrians when to walk and when to wait. Intersections with no such signs were statistically safer because people were more likely to look both ways before crossing the street if there was no blinking sign to tell them when it was safe to do so. They call it a risk compensation. He references the shared spaces concept of traffic, which is both misrepresented by him and also totally inapplicable to the workplace. Roe wants you to believe that safety inspectors are useless, government-funded worry warts who do nothing better than scold people for not wearing the right equipment. Later that same week, another compliance officer, this one with the Department of Natural Resources, interrupted our shoot to insist that I put on a life jacket while installing a culvert and a runoff pond. Now the water in the pond was less than a foot deep. In reality, they perform a multitude of actions behind the scenes to make sure that people are kept safe even before they enter a workplace. By the way, just curious, why didn't Mike Rowe's filming crew have their own safety people since they knew they were going to be placed in dangerous situations? Better hope none of them uh, end up feeling litigious down the line, Mike. Let's talk about those millionaires that Roe loves so much. Entrepreneurship is, at best, a shaky premise for a career. The Bureau of Labor Statistics indicates that among private sector businesses launched in 2013, fewer than half survived into this year. On the other hand, the average benefits of a four-year degree are obvious and substantial. According to a study by Business Insider, while skipping college may seem like a cheaper option, data suggests earnings for college graduates far exceed wages for those with less than a bachelor's degree. Even in North Dakota, the state with the least difference in earnings. Mike Rowe doesn't like guidance counselors for some reason. Guidance counselors in high schools now, in many cases, are, are evaluated and comped based on their ability to help X 
number of students matriculate into a four-year school. That's the goal. I have found nothing to support his claims about them being paid for suggesting four-year colleges, and that doesn't appear to be how just any of this works. What I did find was evidence that guidance counselors help at-risk high school students with crushing everyday problems, and that those counselors are in short supply and probably don't need to be demonized on national television by a laughably fake human cartoon version of a blue-collar fella. But you're not anti-college. Not at all. Yeah. So, so explain that. Okay, I'm so anti-debt. Okay. If I have to pay for part of your membership mm -hmm. in either facility, then I might get a little exercised about your ultimate right. choice if you can't pay it back. That is not how taxes work, and you are not allowed to exercise that level of control over the lives of strangers. This clip sums up Rose's stinking classist attitude here pretty well. A lot of rich people that I write about are happier to give $10 million to a foundation than to give $5 million in taxes. That's kind of interesting. So there, it's not entirely about keeping your money. A lot of them are giving away their money. So what's the difference? Why do they prefer philanthropy over taxation? And the reason has to do with credit and control. When you pay your taxes, you don't get credit. You're just complying with the law. There's no, you don't get a sticker. You don't get a poster. A uh, the mayor is not going to say your name in public. You don't get a handshake. You don't get a photograph. You just paid your taxes. Second of all, you don't get control. When you pay your taxes, you don't say, I want this to go to social insurance. I want this to go to the bus system. No, you just pay your taxes. When you do philanthropy, you get credit and control. Your name goes on the building. Everybody knows you did it. It helps your reputation. If your pharmaceutical company killed people, if your chemical company poisoned someone's river, it helps your reputation because that was bad and now you're doing something good. And part of why I wrote the book is in America today, we have forgotten the tool of the law. We have forgotten the tool of policy. We think that rich people and entrepreneurs are how you make change. And I challenge anyone to tell me which rich person or company has done more for old people in America than Social Security. Which rich person or company has done more for health care for poor people than Medicaid? Uh, which rich person or company has done more for women than suffrage? You know, which poor, uh, rich person or company has done more for African Americans than the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act? We actually know how to change the world. It's when we act together through our shared democratic institutions. But we have been in the grips of this religion that tells us is the way you really make change is not together but alone. This next one is pretty fun and starts with Roe agreeing with an obvious mischaracterization from whoever this chucklehead is. Uh, President Obama, a couple, I guess it was a couple of years ago when he talked about, you know, uh, well, it, it's he's good to talk about a couple of things. You know, when during his stimulus, he talked about shovel-ready jobs. I mean, you know, everybody took that kind of literally that he was talking about you know, uh, building new roads or repaving them. These were, these were physical labor jobs that didn't really materialize with the stimulus. Um, the first time I heard shovel-ready jobs as, a, as mm -hmm. a turn of phrase, I was, I was in a, a water tower in New York with the guys who replaced <laughs> the, the, water wooden, uh, right. the wooden water towers on top of, on top of skyscrapers. And, um, you know, a guy had a, had a small TV and we were on a break and we were watching it. And uh, everybody just laughed at the expression, shovel-ready jobs. And there was, one of the guys I was working with said, you know, the thing is about all that, um, he's going to have a lot more success uh, selling so shovel-ready jobs to a country that still values the notion of picking up a shovel. Mm -hmm. As it turns out, the 2009 American Recovery and Reinvestment Act worked. It not only created millions of jobs, but it may have saved us from the disastrous Republican economic policies that got us into the Great Recession. All serious economists agree with this assessment, to the point that polling reveals that only two of the queried economists disagreed, one of whom is a proponent of failed austerity measures, another scam that only hurt the little people. By the way, since Roe thinks that authenticity is so important, you shouldn't pretend to be somebody you aren't, because, look, in my business, authenticity is Authenticity is for sale everywhere, but especially in my business. You said it before, people can smell a fake. I think they can smell it in the boardroom. 
just as easily as they can smell it in the sewer. I decided to take a closer look at what his foundation actually does. Apparently, he's teamed up with the After School All-Stars Project, a News Corp partner which landed in hot water when a sports program that one of its licensees promised failed to materialize, costing the city of San Ysidro a quarter of a million dollars. So that's not shady at all. It's like what we always say on Dirty Jobs, you know, just, j just because you're passionate about something doesn't mean you can't suck at it. His other educational partner, Skills USA, is another org that takes funding from Charles Koch. And uh, a lot of truths uh, are inconvenient for a lot of people. I could go on. Honestly, there's this whole thing from his sweat pledge, by the way. Yeah, that's a slightly more cartoonified version of rich guy cosplaying as poor guy Mike Rowe, backslapping a black prisoner above a statement which implies that he shouldn't blame anyone else for his situation. That one gets even more gross when you look into it since that guy was literally paid to sign off on that statement. It's part of Rowe's pledges, which are all weirdly judgmental nonsense, like... I believe I'm entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I also understand that happiness and the pursuit of happiness are not the same thing. I deplored that. I do all I can to avoid it. I'd rather live in a tent and eat beans than borrow money to pay for a lifestyle I can't afford. I believe that all people are created equal. I also believe that all people make choices. Some choose to be lazy. Some choose to sleep in. I choose to work my butt off. <laughs> Sweat stands for skill and work ethic aren't taboo. Well, Mike, I have my own pledge that I'm hoping the people watching this video are willing to make right now. It's called Shut Up. Stop helping unethical twits uphold popularity. Maybe I'll even follow your model and sell $100 printouts of my pledge on my website. No, actually I won't because that's stupid and crass and I actually have some dignity. Before we get to the puppies, though, let's see if there are any real solutions for the job market. One fantastic way to increase job growth is through spending on public transportation. So surely Mike Rowe's favorite candidate supports efforts to increase funding on- Ow. No, huh? What a shocker. Another actually proven way to help with employment is through guaranteed public childcare options, which Trump paid lip service to while, in reality, running one of his own grifts. Alright, that's pretty much it for today, and I don't think we really need to get into Mike Rowe's thoughts on the minimum wage. Predictably, they are wrong. This has been a lot of information and you've been very patient. I know that looking at a former QVC host's smug face for so long is tiring, so you know what? Here you go. You've earned it. Puppies! <laughs>